Okay, so we're warming up. Evaluate uh, that we read that as the derivative with respect to x of the integral from five to six x of cosine squared of two t dt. So uh, if you did the order of operations, you would find the antiderivative, evaluate it from five to six x uh, using the FTOC, and then take the derivative of that. But uh, because the derivative and the integral undo each other, there's a way to uh, get the answer without differentiating. Uh, or integrating, and it's going to be some version of the integrand, because if you think about the order of operations, we're starting with that, we're integrating and then differentiating, and because they're inverses, we should end up back where we started, but there is that caveat, right? When we're going from a plain old number like 5 to a plain old x, like x, it would have been just cosine squared of 2x, but we're going to 6x, so right at the end of class yesterday, I mentioned that the uh, if it, it, it doesn't have to always be plain old x's and uh, it doesn't have to be a number on the bottom either. So here's the general rule. When you have the derivative of the integral, you, you plug in the top first. So just like we're doing the first uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, you're gonna plug in a six x for every t, okay? So when I do that, I'm gonna get two times six x, which is 12 x. And then you're going to multiply by the derivative of what you plugged in. What did I plug in? A 6x. So its derivative is 6. Yeah. So plug in the top times the derivative of what you plugged in. Not the derivative of what you created, but the derivative of what you plugged in. And then minus, like the first part of the FCOC, you plug in the bottom. Cosine squared of 2 times 5 is 10 times the derivative of what you plugged in, which is 0. If you can remember that rule, that works in the special case when you are going from just a plain old number to a plain old x, okay? And then if you simplify, of course, you get six cosine squared of 12x minus zero, and that's your answer. So uh, if this were like a multiple choice question, this might be answer choice A. Answer choice B might be six cosine squared 2x, right? Answer choice C might be cosine squared of 2x and answer choice d might be cosine squared of 12x okay now, the ap exam only has four four choices now instead of five so and there's no penalty for a wrong answer you accumulate points so it's a, you know a little bit easier yes uh, I was going to ask if one of the wrong ones could be cosine squared of 72x. Oh, 72x. I, I mean, I could certainly, like, if I were making one, maybe I could throw that in there for you. Yeah, because when you multiply by the chain rule, you did it inside the parentheses? Okay, okay, all right. So anyway, the answer would be A. The answer would be A. So. Um, let's let's kind of review again. When you're going to take the derivative of the integral from a function of x to a function of x, you plug in the top, which is g of x, times the derivative of what you plugged in, minus you plug in the bottom, h of x, and then times the derivative of what you plugged in. Okay. We did this one yesterday um, by the shortcut rule. I want to I do want to show you again just why why we have to multiply by the derivative of what we plugged in. Okay, and it comes from the chain rule. So this one we actually can do in two steps. So let's do that. DDX of secant squared becomes tangent. And then um, I evaluate it from one to two X cubed. And we still have the derivative up front, right? So now I plug in the top and I get tangent of two X cubed. So that should not be a surprise why we plug in the top for T, right? Two X cubed. Um, minus we plug in the bottom and we get secant squared of one. But now look what I'm doing. Now I'm taking the derivative, right? So what's the derivative of tangent of blob? Well, the derivative of tangent of blob is secant squared of the blob, which is what we would get if we just plugged in times the what? Chain rule, the derivative of the blob, which is six X squared. So that's why we have to do that. And then minus, of course, the derivative of that is zero. So there's your answer from yesterday, six X squared times secant squared of two X cubed. All right. All right, part B, uh, the derivative of the integral from e to the X to seven. 
So notice um, you're going from a function to seven. If you want, you could flip the intervals of integration and go from seven to e to the x. But remember to do that, you put a negative out front. It's not really worth it because it'll take care of itself. The derivative of the integral, well, they undo each other. So let's plug in a seven first for every t. So we get seven squared plus five times seven times the derivative of seven, which is zero, right? Minus plug in the bottom and we get uh, e to the x quantity squared plus five times e to the x. And then all of that times the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x, yeah. Now, in this case, the whole first term goes to zero. So had you flipped the intervals of integration to get the number on the bottom, you know, when the number's on the bottom, you know, you'd have to worry about plugging it in. That negative then that you would put out front, it works out anyway, right? So we end up with this negative out front. And our final answer then is e to the x times, I'm going to put it in front, e to the 2x plus 5e to the x. So that's probably a good pattern to get into. Derivative of the integral, plug in the top times the derivative of what you plugged in, minus plug in the bottom times the derivative of what you plugged in. Now, oh yeah, I forgot the negative. I pointed to it and I forgot it. Yeah, I'm an idiot with a bad short-term memory. I'm an idiot with a bad short-term memory. That wasn't the that wasn't the second course. That was just me repeating it because I'd forgotten I'd already said it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, now here's the deal. You're going to get so used to just like, oh, I could plug in the top minus plug in the bottom. If you, if you have something like this, the integral from e to the x of seven of t squared plus five t, if that's, is, if that's what you're given and you're asked to evaluate it, can you just plug in the top minus plug in the bottom? Does that work here? No, no, why? Because we haven't even integrated yet, yes? You can only not integrate <laughs> if it's the derivative of the integral, right? You can't just start plugging things in unless you know that there's two operations there that undo each other to get you back to the same form. So for this, you would actually have to go ahead and say, ah, oh, that's one third t cubed plus five half t squared, and then evaluate it like normal. Okay, so you get in this kind of I don't know you you're lulled into this overgeneralization okay. bias. Yeah, but the derivative of the integral you can undo it. Yeah. What do you mean? What do you mean? I did it backwards. Oh, I thought I did seven squared first. I, oh, yeah. That if I did that, that would have been an accident. I'm sorry. Let's see. Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did that backwards. Yeah. So yeah, I because I knew it was going to work. Thank you, Mason. Good eye. Yeah. No, that I don't want to confuse you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, there's a DDX in front of the integral. Yeah, yeah, because you're 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 doing inverse. These are inverses. Yeah, you know it's gonna zero out. So that was saying it doesn't. No, that would say there's no. That's if there is no DDX and you're just evaluating an integral. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, be careful. There's not always gonna be a DDX in front of the integral. Again, if I have something like, um. Yeah, well, the next example, right? Look, the next example. If big F of X is equal to that, find F prime of X. There's no DDX in front of the integral, right? But it's still the same thing. This is the noun version. I have a function F that's defined to be an integral function, and I want to find its derivative, right? So as I showed you yesterday, you could put the DDX in front of the integral because you could take the derivative of both sides. What would the derivative of the left side be? There would be f prime of x, and you either go straight to the derivative of the integral on this side, or you put the notation, the derivative with respect to x 
of the integral, but you don't even have to write that. What I'm doing right now, you don't have to write that. You can go straight to what the next line would actually be, okay? So now notice it is the derivative of the integral. Um, and I go from a function of X to a function of X. That's fine. It's still the same general idea. The derivative of the integral, they undo each other. So I plug in the top, plug in the top, right? The natural log of three to the X times the derivative of three to the X, which is itself. Are y'all talking about math? I hope because then, then it's tolerable if you whisper quieter. Yeah. All right, minus, you plug in the bottom, the natural log of two plus sine of two X times the derivative of what you plugged in, which is zero plus, and then the derivative of sine of two X, remember is sine of cosine of two X, or I'll put zero plus cosine of two X times its own chain rule two, okay? The derivative of the integral. That's the second part of the fundamental theorem. Derivative of the integral. Don't have to integrate. The only differentiating you do is on the chain rule. So again, let's 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 kind of spiral back to what we did yesterday on the special case. We'll call this example 11b. If uh, if I say big F is, let's just say uh, the integral from five to x of tangent cubed of t dt. What is big F prime of x? Tangent cubed of x, right. Yeah, this is, goes back to the special case. I am going from a plain old number to a plain old x, so it is plain old integrand instead of t, it's x. Now, again, if you don't want to memorize the special rule now, just do the same thing every time. I'm not going to put d dx of the integral this time. I'm just going to be like, oh, it is the derivative of the integral. So it's just going to be tangent cubed of x times the derivative of x with respect to x, which is one, minus tangent cubed of five times the derivative of five, which is zero. Right, that works every time. And of course that simplifies to tangent cubed of X. As zero wipes out and one times anything is itself, okay? So memorize the general, it works uh, in more generally, yeah? And then the special case works in this case as well. It's barely even much of a time saver. Okay, um, now truth be told most of the time, you're gonna be using the special case version because you're gonna be asked to find like absolute max and mins of a function big F. Um, and the only time it's gonna be like not from a variable to X is when it's like a standalone multiple choice question. Okay, something like that, just standalone multiple choice question. Um, so let's, 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 let me, let me give you an example here. Uh, example, um, do, 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 do. For big F of X equaling uh, the integral from one to X of, let's do uh, T squared DT, uh, find the um, absolute extrema of big F of X on the interval uh, from negative one to two. I, for big F is the integral from one to X squared. We wanna find the absolute extreme. That means the absolute max and min, okay? Now, in this case, the EVT actually applies because big F is continuous on the closed interval. If you were to actually integrate it, you would get a cubic polynomial, which is continuous everywhere. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, okay, what is big F of negative one? 
what is big F of two? This is back to the game show, right? So not just the function value at the endpoints, but I need the function value at any critical values on the interior, right? So how do I find critical values? Set what equal to zero? The derivative of what? FX. Which f of x? Uh, big, f of x. big f. There you go. So I need the derivative of big f. So on my own, I'm finding the derivative of my function, which happens to be the derivative of big f of x. And now you're like, oh, the derivative of the integral from one to x of t squared is just what? x squared. Yeah. And now I'll set that equal to zero and I get x equals zero. Is zero on the interval from negative one to two? It is. So now I need f of zero. Okay, so zero is a critical value of big F. And now how do I evaluate it? Now it's back to what we did yesterday. I plug in big F of negative one is the integral from one to negative one of t squared dt. Uh, big F of zero is the integral from one to zero of t squared dt. And big F of two is the integral from one to two of t squared dt. Now, all of these are going to have the same antiderivative, right? Could I use symmetry on the, on the first one? Symmetrical interval from one to negative one t squared? I could, but I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to go one third t cubed. We evaluate it from one to negative one. Uh, one third t cubed from one to zero. And then one third t cubed from one to two. So for me, remember, I like to leave the constant out front. So if I plug in negative one cubed is negative one minus plug in a one, you get one. And this ends up being negative two times a third, which is negative two thirds. All right, the next one, leave the one third out front, plug in a zero minus plug in a one. Here you get negative one third. And on the last one, plug in a two, you get eight minus plug in a one, you get one, you get seven thirds, okay? So by the EVT, one of these is the max and it looks like the maximum value is seven thirds and it occurs at two. Please pardon this interruption. Just want to let all of our testers know that you have until one o'clock and then you'll be released for lunch. So all testers you have just until one o'clock and then you'll be released for lunch. And then at that time, any teachers that are testing, you'll turn in um, all of your testing supplies. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. And then F of negative one is negative two thirds. That's smaller than negative a third. So that's your absolute min. And it occurs at negative one. Okay. So that's one way we can use it. Now let's do a follow-up question here. The critical value that was on the interior zero, it ended up not being the absolute max nor the absolute min. My question is, is it, is it even a relative extrema? Here's where you have to be careful, right? Is it a relative extrema? Well, let's see. If we did a number line chart, here's X, here's big F prime, and we would test it to the left and right of zero. Well, when I pick my values like negative one and one, I got to plug those into the derivative. What is the derivative of big F? It's X squared, right? And when you plug in a negative one, you get a positive. When you plug in a positive one, you get a positive. So is zero a local max or min of big F? No, no. Now it certainly is the local minimum of big F prime, X squared itself bounces there. So notice what we're doing here. We're doing kind of the same thing we did before, but the notation is a little squirrely. Instead of starting with little F and going to F prime and asking about little F, we're starting with little F and we're backing it up. And now we're talking about big F, okay? But it's the same idea. So that's where the first, that's where the derivative of the integral usually shows up. When you're, when you're providing it, it's just from a constant to an X. But sometimes on a multiple choice, you know, you might get a standalone question like this, all right? Okay. Um, and again, there's practice problems like that on the worksheet uh, on, your next, um, on your next set of five, and I'll try to keep it to five um, that for tomorrow. Um, I'll, I'll put a couple of questions that involve that, all right?
Um, it should release to you right away. I need to put it in the grade book though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should tell you what you got right and wrong. Yeah. Wait, as soon as he turns in or whenever it's supposed to It'll tell you how many you missed. I, I released it upon submission. Yeah, it takes a second to update. Yeah. Like go out of it sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the mean value theorem, again, but this time for integrals. Uh, this one is pretty important because of the consequence. It's kind of a corollary of it. So just to review, the mean value theorem for derivatives or just the mean value theorem for derivatives, okay? If it just says mean value theorem, we're talking about derivatives. If it's mean value theorem for integrals, which we don't really know yet, it's gonna say for integrals. Now, remember what this one says. It says, if F is continuous on a closed interval from A to B and diffable, differentiable on the open, from A to B. So no, no cusps or vertical tangents on the interior. Then there exists a, 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 a C value, we'll call it C. Then there exists a C strictly on the open interval between A and B, such that the average rate of change, F of B minus F of A over B minus A equals the derivative. I'll put the derivative first where F prime of C equals that, All right? So that's where the average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. If you're looking at a graph like this, here's A, here's B. You can visualize it by drawing the secant line, right? Which is the average rate of change. And boom, there's one value C1. And this one actually has another value C2, All right? The farmer had to have been going 70 on the interval between A and B because his average velocity was, uh, I'm sorry, he had to be going no greater than 55 because his average velocity was 70. By the mean value theorem, he had to be going 70 at least once, okay? Um, so the theorem is, is guaranteeing the X value where it occurs. All right, now the mean value theorem for integrals also has to do with mean, meaning average, but it's slightly different. Here's what it says. If F is continuous on a closed interval, and that's it. So we're kind of back to the same hypothesis as the IVT and the EVT. If we got a function that's continuous on a closed, then there is a number C, but this time, like the IVT and the EVT, we're back to the closed interval. The X value we're looking for could be an endpoint um, where the following is true. The integral from A to B is equal to the function value at that x value, call it f of c, times the width of the interval b minus a. All right, now this one is a lot easier to visualize if you think of area, but it works for net accumulation. So let's look at it as an area. Let's say f of x is greater than zero on the interval, okay? So here's a, here's b, here's my function right here, f of x. That function is continuous on the close, yes? So here's what it says. If you were to find the integral from A to B, which in this case does in fact represent the area, right? Then there is a C value between A and B or at A and B where the function value there, call it F of C, times the width of the interval from B minus A, when you multiply them together, gives you the same value as the integral. So here's why it's nice to look at uh, in terms of area. What we're saying then is there exists a height of a rectangle whose area on the same width from, from A to B gives you equal areas as the area under the curve. In other words, the area under the curve in red is equivalent to the area of the rectangle on the same interval, right? The area of the rectangle is the same as the area under the curve. So they both have the same width. So I guess that would mean that the, the, the lobe above the rectangle and the lobe that we cut out are equal in, 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 in mass. And it's easy to see why it exists. Watch this. If you use a Y value that is the absolute minimum on the interval, 
this rectangle is obviously too small to become the area under the curve, right? We're missing all of that above. And similarly, if you use the Y value on the interval to be the absolute maximum Y value, then the area of this rectangle is obviously more than the area under the curve, right? So through a continuum, as you go from a Y value that's obviously too small to a Y value that's too big, you're gonna end up with a Y value that's what? Exactly right, okay? Exactly right. So um, the theorem guarantees at least one, one X value where the height at that X value gives you the height of that rectangle, okay? Now, what's most important about the mean value theorem is that F of C, the height at that X value has a special name. It's called the average value. And when we say average value, if you want to sneak it in there, it's the average Y value, right? It's the average height of the graph, the average Y value. Now that's important because if I wanted to find your average grade in here, I would just add up all your grades and divide by the number of grades. That gives you the average grade. But that only works because you have a finite number of grades, okay? If you have an infinite number of things that exist through a continuum and you're trying to figure out what the average value is, you can't add up infinitely many things and then divide by infinity, right? It doesn't work. For instance, temperature. If you look at the outdoor temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, again, over time of day and hours, even though we're not um, recording them, the temperatures rise and fall through a continuum. If you wanted to figure out what the average temperature was during the day, if you could model a curve that represents the temperature during the day, and you could do that easily on your TI-84, just collect data points and fit a curve to it. Instead of adding up all your data points and dividing by the number of data points you have, which is an okay way to do it, right? That's probably what you do in a science class. When you take readings, you, add, you find the average by adding them up. But what that does is it neglects all the values in between your readings that you did not collect. So this would be the better way to find the average. It's, it's, the, it's what I call the average by the density method. And it works well for continuous functions. By fitting a curve to the data points, you can now find the average by doing this. If you take this equation here and you solve for F of C, which is the average Y value, it's the average of whatever you're measuring on the y-axis. Just divide both sides by B minus A, and you get this. The average value is now the integral over the width. It's the integral over the width. Or you might see sometimes the width is pulled out front as one over the width. When it's given to you to interpret, this is usually how it's, it's given. But when you're setting it up, I prefer you to do the integral over the width. So what the integral does is it gives you the mass accumulation. It gives you like aggregate units, like kilowatt hours. The integral is gonna give you the height times the width. And if you divide through by the width, look what happens to your widths. It divides out and you get the average height. So that's the density method, all right? So what would that look like unit wise? If I actually had degrees Fahrenheit, against hours, and I wanted to figure out the average temperature, the integral, I'm just gonna just write it short for the average temperature is gonna be the integral over the width. Well, the units of the integral are gonna be multiplication, right? Degrees Fahrenheit times hours. And that's again, what we call an aggregate unit. Aggregate unit like kilowatt hours. This is Fahrenheit hours. That doesn't make sense to report temperature in Fahrenheit hours, but it's an aggregate unit. If you divide back through by the width, what happens? Your hours divide out and you're left with back two degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when you put a bar over a letter, do y'all know what that means? That typically means average. That gives you the average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit over that entire interval. Now, I would never calculate your grade this way because your grades are discrete values, right? 
if you made a 50 on one thing and a hundred on another, it doesn't mean that you have every grade between 50 and hundred existing somewhere in between there, but for temperatures it does. Okay. And a lot of other continuous things. So integral over width, integral over width, integral over width gives you the average value. Now, once you found the average temperature, if you wanted to figure out at what time of day did that happen, then all you'd have to do is set your, your Y value back equal to the original function F of X, right? If you set the average value, if you set F of C equal to your average value F of X, then you can solve for X to get X equals C, okay? I'll show you what I mean. Average value. So that's why it's called the mean value theorem average value, but it's the average of whatever you're measuring on the y-axis. All right, so here's the example. It's a calculator question. Temperature. Uh, in New Braunfels, I hear it's nice there. The temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, T hours after 9 a.m. So that means 9 a.m. corresponds with T equals zero hours. Was modeled by this function. Big T of T equals 50 plus 14 sine of pi T 12. Now, before I do anything, I want to review uh, a little bit of pre-cal with y'all. Let's go ahead and see if we could sketch this. I'm gonna put it in the standard transformation form. This is gonna be pi twelfths times T plus 50. Now, what we're gonna do is just do a quick sketch of it, okay? So here is my graph. What does the uh, 50 do to this function? raises it up to 50, right? Because the sinusoidal axis, if you remember, was originally at zero on the x-axis. Now the sinusoidal axis is up here at 50, right, Brody? And then 14 is the wave height. It's the amplitude, okay? So from 50, I'm going to go up to a high point of 50 plus 14, which is 64. And from 50, I'm going to go down to a low point of 50 minus 14, which is 36, okay? So this wave height oscillates between 36 and 64. That's a pretty typical Texas day right about now, yeah? Although today was warmer than usual this morning. All right, and now we wanna figure out the period. So remember the period is two pi over B, the absolute value of B. So our B value is pi twelfths. So 2 pi divided by pi 12 is the same as 2 pi times the reciprocal 12 pi. And with the pi's divide out, then you get 24. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. That's a pretty good period for temperature during the day, isn't it? Yeah. So here is hours since 9 a.m. Hours since 9 a.m. Here's zero. Here's 24 hours later, half of 24 is 12, half of 12 is six. So remember, that's how you divide it up in the quarter cycle interval. So six, 12, 18, 24. And now it's Sahala with no phase shift, no horizontal shift. So we start right here at our axis at 0, 050. So it's axis high, axis low, axis. And there's kind of what the temperatures are doing throughout the day. Now, if you want, this is 9 a.m. Six hours later is what? 3 p.m. Six hours later is 9 p.m. And then six hours later is 3 a.m. And then uh, the sun rises again. I hope 9 a.m. Today's the day, right? I hope the nuclear warheads don't go off sometime today. Right. Oof. All right. So anyway, there it is. Now I want to figure out the average daily temperature. One real primitive way to do it would be just to average these temperatures. 50 plus 64 plus 50 plus 36 plus 50 and then divide, add them up and divide by six. That's not a good way to do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it by the density method. We're going to find the area under this curve, all right, between um, zero, well, we wanna do it from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., sorry. It says through a 12 hour period. It's always good to read. 
Well, I only want to know for the for I just drew it for one cycle for a full day, but I want to figure what the average temperature was from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So instead of adding up the three points, 50 plus 64 plus 50 and dividing by three, we're going to find the area under this curve and we're going to divide it by the width from zero to 12. And that should give us the area. OK, because we got degrees Fahrenheit over here. So we're going to let the calculator do that for us. Because y'all don't know how to integrate that yet by hand. So here we go, calculator. And if you want to watch, you can. If you have your calculator in front of you, uh, you can play along. Coach Starathon. All right. Um, you don't have to wait for me. If you have your calculator, know what you're doing. You all know what you're doing. Choose file. Choose file. Yum. Okay, five. I'm going with the fifth ROM that I downloaded before Hank fixed me up proper. Now, um, I don't think I even need to graph this. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it in Y1 anyway. I should be in radian mode. So make sure you check. I am 14 uh, sin sine of, and then pi twelfths. If you want to use the horizontal division bar, it's fine. Pi twelfths and then times X. We always use X close plus 50. I don't really need to graph it, but if you wanted to graph it, you would graph it from zero to 24 or zero to 12 and then from zero to 64 at least, right? I just want that to be a placeholder. So I'm going to go back to the home screen now and um, I want to find the average temperature. So here's what we're going to do. We always set it up on our calculator or our paper first. The average value. Now, what are we measuring on the y-axis? Degrees Fahrenheit. Average value is always, always, put that in parentheses, Mason. Whole quantity. Yeah. The average temperature in this case, which is the average y value, is equal to the integral from 0 to 12. That's from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Now, you could either use big T of little t, because that's its proper name, which saves a lot of writing on a calculator portion of an exam, dt. Or if you do what Mason did, that's fine. Just make sure if you write the actual expression, you put parentheses around the two terms, OK? It's always better, beneficial to have a proper noun, like f of x, g of x, big T of t for a function. So if it didn't have one, you'd want to give it to it on a calculated portion because you can refer to it all over 12 minus zero. We know 12 minus zero is 12, but again, you want to indicate your method. Integral over width, integral over width, integral over width. The average Y value, in this case, average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is the integral over the width, right, Brody? Now, let's go ahead and type it in. Here we go. From the home screen, here's why we do it on the home screen. Alpha Y equals, boom. In the numerator, we're going to do math 9. And we're going to go from 0 to 12 of, and now I can recall it, alpha trace number 1 with respect to x. Everything's xy. And then all divided by, what the heck, 12 minus 0. Why not? We don't find the integral first and then divide it by 12, because you may forget to divide it by 12. It's the integral divided by the width. Boom. And we get the average temperature on that 12-hour period was 58.912 or 913 degrees Fahrenheit. And is that a reasonable number? Certainly is. Certainly is. Yeah. So that's a much better answer. If you were just to do it this way, right? If you were to add up those three data points, which was 50 plus 64 plus 50 again. Oops, plus 50. And then divide by three you get huh, 54.666, right? Yeah, it's a little different, right? It's just another way to do it. Which number in this case would be more accurate? The one we did on the integral, right? Because it's the density method. It takes into account all the values in between our readings. So that's, that's the best way to find an average for continuous data, all right? The other way works, but not the best thing. OK, um, now you might be asked for the average temperature, but 
here's what the theorem says. The mean value theorem says there had to be at least one time of day between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. where the temperature was actually this temperature. And you're like, well, no doy, right? You can't have an average temperature of this if it wasn't that ever because it's continuous data. Now, the theorem does allow for it to occur at an endpoint. Um, I don't think it's going to be at either one of our endpoints because I already know in advance that that's when it's 50, but it could have been. So here's how we find it. To find the X values where it occurs, or in this case, the T values, you're going to say, so big T of T equals 58.912 dot, 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 dot. And that's a reminder to myself to not use a rounded number. Now, anytime you're setting up an equation, you could find where these two intersect on the graph, but to find where it intersects on the graph, you're gonna to have to adjust your Y window, aren't you? To include 58.912. Well, if you've already sketched this graph, you probably already have it in that nice window. So let's go ahead and, and graph it now. Because this, this usually would show up on a free response question. So there's there it is in Y1. On my window now, I'm gonna go from zero to what the heck, I'll go to 24. I'll count by zeros. My Y min, I always like to go a little bit above and below because I know it uses the top and bottom for writing. So I'll go from negative 10 to 100 and I'll count by zeros. So now if you hit graph, you should see something that resembles our curve. All right, now to figure out where it equals 58.912, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to the home screen. I didn't store this value up here. So I'm going to recalculate it, and I'm going to store it as alpha A. Boom. And if I store it as A on my paper, this is degrees Fahrenheit. I do have to put units, but I'm going to put equals A. All right. Now, instead of bringing it across and setting it equal to zero, which is what we usually do to solve equations, because I already have it graphed in a nice window, I'm just going to put alpha A right there. It'll remember what alpha A is. You can recall stored values other than X in your Y equals screen. Now, when you hit a graph, holy crap. It was not only that temperature once, which the theorem guaranteed, it was that temperature twice, once on the way heating up above it and once below it. So now we can solve it. This is at T equals second trace number what? Five, enter, enter, and what the heck? I'll find the smaller of the two first. So. Just scroll with it, baby. Mm -hmm. Just scroll with it, baby. There we go. Boom. Yeah, you get 2.636 hours. And T equals second trace number five. Enter, enter. More scrolling. More scrolling. Get over there past the uh, local max. Okay, boom. And T equals 9.363 hours. Now, if you wanted to figure out what that, wa wa what that was in clock time, you could have stored both of those X values as well, right? Like right now, if I wanted to store that X value, go to your home screen and do X sto as like alpha B. So before you find the next one, you could actually store it. So if it wanted clock time, let's just do this one since I did it. That would be nine hours after 9 a.m., right? Which, let's see what that would be in clock time. Nine hours after 9 a.m. is what? 6 p.m.? So at 6, and now here's what I would do. I would recall it from the home screen in its full decimal glory. I would subtract out the nine hours, right? and then convert what's left to the next smallest unit of time, which is minutos by multiplying by 60. So it'd be 621 PM. And you can even go down to the segundos, right? Minus 21, multiply by 60 one more time, and we'll say uh, 50. And here we just go three, four, six uh, PM, right? Those would be units. So at 621, 50, boom, right there. You talk about, Olympic times being accurate to the nearest thousandth, right? Temperature was that temperature at the December, but not later. Not before, not after. Until it came. Well, that was where it was coming back down. Okay. No, it doesn't last long at all. That's why you got to 
savor every moment. Yeah. All right, so that's a pretty cool theorem. That's one of my favorite theorems that we do. Now it's called the average value theorem, but remember it's the average Y value. And in a word problem, it's the average of whatever you're measuring on the Y axis, okay? So you got to read carefully. Is it looking for the X value or is it looking for the average Y value or both? Yes. Whatever. Yes, I would I would tell you to get in the habit of always labeling your integrals and by putting average temp you're reminding yourself as well okay. Now, let me show you uh, another kind of little variation on this, this makes a really good free response question if if you were given the same intro to the question in New Braunfels the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit T hours after 9am was modeled by this function. Okay, it might ask you before it asks you to do what we just did. It might ask you to do this. Um, uh, explain in a complete sentence with units. I'm not going to write all that out. What the meaning of this is one over 12, the integral of big T of D of T DT from zero to 12 means in the context of the problem. All right, explain what that means in the context of the problem in a complete sentence with units. Well, you're looking at that and you're like, I know what the integral from zero to 12 is, right? That's the net accumulation in units of temperature degrees Fahrenheit times T hours. That's gonna give me Fahrenheit hours. How do I know that? Just by looking at it, it's always units of big T in this case times units of little t. The integral always gives you units of Integrand times independent variable. But what is the one over 12 in front? You're like looking at one over a number. That's a constant multiple. He's out front. Get to the front. Get in the back of the truck. But they're saying it has some context. Well, if you ever see one over a number in front of an integral, it's probably going to be the average value, especially when the number in the denominator is the width, right? I'm going from zero. To, so that's really one over 12 minus zero. So that's their way of giving you integral over width. I think it's easier for us when we find it to do integral over width. It's the same as one over the width times the integral. So you'd be like, oh, one over a number. Okay. So now this is going to give you, so here's what you'd say. This, a judicious choice of an ad uh, pronoun, this gives the average temperature you always use whatever this is, okay? It's the average value of whatever your integrand is. It gives you the average temperature comma in degrees Fahrenheit from, and then you answer like an engineer, from T equals zero hours to T equals 12 hours. That's it. Do I have units on both independent and dependent variables? Yeah, now you can spice it up. This gives the average temperature in New Braunfels, Texas in degrees Fahrenheit from T equals zero hours, which is 9 a.m. to T equals 12 hours, which is 9 p.m. You don't have to do that. I wouldn't even say from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., which would not be incorrect. You want to answer like an engineer, right? From T equals zero hours to T equals 12 hours, boom. Like an engineer, not like a robot, like an engineer, right? They're the real technical people. All right. Now, it uh, it might ask you after you uh, uh, write this sentence, it might ask you to actually find that value. All right. In which case you would find the integral and multiply by 12. Okay. But it might just ask you to find the average temperature and you're responsible for setting up your own integral. Integral over width. Okay. We got 10 minutes. That's great. Okay. Um, so far, so good. All right. Let's look at example C. Uh, find the value of C guaranteed by the MVT for integrals for the function one plus X squared on the interval from negative one to two. Interpret your result graphically at the end. Okay. MVT for integrals. MVT for integrals. Am I walking away with the average value or the X value where it occurs? the X value where it occurs, right? 
if you're looking for the X value where it occurs, you have to first find the average value. So even though it says the MVT for integrals, I would set it up this way. I would say F of C, or you could say the average value, however you want, it equals the integral over the width, the integral over the width, the integral over the width. So it's gonna be the integral from negative one to two of one plus X squared DX all over the width from negative one to two, which is two minus negative one. Now notice in this case, instead of putting little f of x there for the setup, I actually put one plus x squared because this is a non-calculator question and I'm gonna to have to manipulate the expression. So you could have put f of x, but then you're gonna to have to on the next line, plug it in. All right, now that you have it set up, integral over width and you've labeled it either as average value or f of c, now, if you want, you could pull the constant multiple out front, right? When we're typing it into our calculator, it's just easier to do integral divided by horizontal line width, but two minus negative one is really three. So I'm gonna pull the one third out front. And now I can find the antiderivative as I go from this line to the next. Antiderivative of one is X plus one third X cubed. And if you put the evaluation bar, it can go either inside the brackets or it can go outside the brackets either way from negative one to two. All right, now I got, I got one third beefy bracket and now it's plug in the top minus plug in the bottom, right? I do that when I have more than one term with the beefy bracket, okay? So now I plug in the two and I get two plus eight thirds. Minus, I plug in the negative one and I get negative one minus one third. Now I can't stop there, even though it's a free response because I need to find the X value and that's the Y value. So do you think it would help simplifying that if I need to find the X value? I'm gonna need to set that back equal to one plus X squared. So yeah, let's, this is how they get you. Let's go ahead and simplify. So one third, and again, Let's go ahead and add the fractions together first. I get eight thirds minus a negative one third. Well, that's really eight thirds plus one third, which is nine thirds or three. So the fractions did take care of themselves. And then I have a two minus a negative one, which is really two plus one or three. So that's six times a third, that's equal to two. So this is the average Y value. It's the average Y value. We're not measuring anything on the Y axis, okay? Now it says to find the values where they exist. So what am I gonna do for that? I'm gonna drop down below. So now I'm gonna say, okay, F of X must equal two for at least one X value between negative one and two inclusive. All right, you're gonna get another check for that. Now, again, you could also say one plus X squared equals two because the same reasoning, I'm gonna to have to manipulate the expression. Some version of F of X equals two gets the credit, but now I plug it in and I solve and I get X squared equals one and X equals the square root of one plus or minus. So negative one or positive one. Now we're faced with, ooh, a little bit of a quandary. A quandary. Do I include both X values or just one of them? One of them for sure is on the interior, but the negative one is an endpoint. Ah, oh, it invoked the theorem. Does the theorem allow me to use endpoints? This one does, yes. If this were an MVT for derivatives though, no, that's the only one that excludes the endpoints. So, that's an important little finer point to remember, finer point, point, finer point. So we'll include both of these, okay? Both of these values satisfy the equation. All right, now graphically, what does that look like? I'm glad, I'm glad it asked us because I'm gonna keep borrowing this space down here. One plus X squared is the same as X squared plus one. Here's the Y intercept of one. It opens up like this. It has y-axis symmetry. Here's negative one. Come across here. Here's positive one. And we're looking on the interval from negative one to two. So I'm going out a little bit further here. 
Whoa, I need to move my graph over. I need to extend it up here a little bit. Not the box. Box, you stay put. It's like when I want to take my cute dog for my walk and my ugly dog wants to go too. No, you stay put. I'm just taking the cute. I'm just kidding. I have to get one of them ready first because it gets out of hand. And the other one's like, are you going without me? Oh, oh, are you going without me? No, I'm not going without you. Right? All right. Now, notice that uh, what we're saying is then th this is the point negative one comma two. And this is the point one comma two. Two is the average value. So the height of the rectangle on that interval represents the area under the curve. Let me just get this last little thing in. That area right there is equivalent to the purple area. Okay. The area of the shaded green region under the curve is equivalent. See, I wish they would have given us that five extra minutes because nest period doesn't start till 140. And I would have liked to have used the four minutes in here instead of giving out four minutes of extra pay. And I'm sure y'all feel the same way. Yes, yeah, it's not drawn to scale. It's not drawn to scale. The rectangular area is the same as this little carved out region. So yeah, yeah, this little region here is equivalent to that in, inside, yeah. But it's not drawn to scale. Yeah, okay. Bye -bye. All right. Y'all have a fantastic super. We didn't finish, but that's okay. It's important. Correct. Yes. Yeah, they're equal in area.